Have you ever noticed how much we are evaluating what we see, what we hear, what we feel, what we experience? You guys have been doing it ever since you walked in here this morning, right? You, you evaluated where you were going to sit down, right, Caleb? You, you left. <laughs> I don't want to sit next to him. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> He might pick on me. <laughs> we, but seriously, aren't we doing that all the time? You, you evaluate the smells in the room. You evaluate the people in the room. You, and you pick your spot even based on all kinds of evaluations that we're making. How many of you uh, shop on Amazon? Okay, what are, you, what are you constantly being asked? You've got to give your evaluation. You've got to you know, put down your mark of you know, whether you liked it or not. You know, how many happy faces or how many stars? Or like that. Anybody Yelp here? Yeah, a few of you Yelp. Please Yelp Higher Grounds Coffee House and say that the coffee's wonderful, even if you don't like it. <laughs> so... <clears throat> Eve, and how many, um, in fact, I love, this one gets frustrating to me. Uh, re recently, I had to call a utility. By the time I finally got to a person to deal with my issue, um, my first question was, do you like getting us all, when we're all frustrated and upset? <laughs> and this person like, yeah, not really, but it's my job. <laughs> And, and, then, and then what are you supposed to do? At the end of it, you're supposed to give an evaluation. of. And, 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 and I, I'm really trying to make sure that my evaluation is just of the person. But I really want to say a lot of things about why did I have to go through 10 different numbers to finally get to somebody real to deal with the problem? But, of course, uh, that's not what they're asking me. We're, we are evaluating all the time. You're evaluating your professors, right, crew? <laughs> Oh, yeah, you evaluate them before you even take the class, right? <laughs> yeah, of course, they're evaluating you, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, when do the grades come? <laughs> we're, we're into evaluations all, all the time. Uh, um, in fact, uh, <clears throat> we are also being evaluated by God. Appreciate Revelation 2 and 3. In Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus is actually evaluating seven different churches. Uh, he's going to see things in them that he, that he likes and appreciates. But he's also going to point out things that really bother him, that disturb him about those seven churches. And today, we're going to begin a, core, a series on evaluations uh, and the evaluation is the evaluation by God. That's the most important one. And we're going to ask God to evaluate our church here. Uh, in fact, uh, crew and, and, and serenity, <laughs> you guys get to evaluate us every week, right? And you kind of can come in and you kind of say, you know, and here, crew, you're here this weekend. Were you welcomed or not? Boy, you, you guys have a real chance to, to evaluate us and, and put all kinds of negative things on Yelp about us, right? <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, I, I don't think that that floor was very comfortable that you've been sleeping on the last two nights. <laughs> and, and so you're, you're evaluating. And every guest that comes to a church is evaluating. In fact, most people, they say that you evaluate and you decide whether you're coming back to a church which in the, within the first five seconds by the time you make it in the door, if you made it in the door. Right? Because you're evaluating outside. Okay, what do they look like? Yeah, what are they driving? Is there a parking place for me? Where's the front door? How do we get into this place? What are they going to be like in there? Are they as weird inside as they are outside? You know, and, you're, and you're doing all that kind of evaluating before you ever even get into the door. And then it goes on from there. And see, I, see this, I understand it. You've already been evaluated. Some of you have already decided it's time to tune out. Okay? <laughs> I'm done, okay, I've got other things to do this morning that are more important, so I'm just going to do that and let him think I'm listening. <laughs> Some of you are going to close your eyes and pray a lot, right? <clears throat> just be careful if your praying comes, goes into tongues and, and the interpretation is... <laughs> you're, evalu you're evaluating. 
And, and, and what we want, we want to look at 1 Thessalonians and allow it to evaluate us, both our church as well as us individually. So even for those of you who crew, you guys are just here for one day. But God wants you to look at your life. And I hope that's what you've been doing even in the last three days as you've been here for your retreat, that you've been evaluating, you've been listening to the Lord, you've been allowing him to speak to you. In fact, serenity, I, hope, I pray the same thing, right? That the experience that you guys are going through, that you're not just caught up in saying, you know, oh, I've, got, I've messed up, I've got issues in my life. But, but no, but God cares so much about me. He brought me up to this mountain to make to bring a new change, to give me something special, something brand new, and to bless me. And maybe that's even why I'm here today. God's at work in us. <clears throat> Evaluations, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. Paul, Silas, and Timothy. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. <clears throat> Paul only spent three weeks with the Thessalonians. Three weeks in Thessalonica. Three weeks where he spoke, and in fact, some say it may have only been two. He was there for three Sabbaths, that's what we know. For three different Sabbaths, he spoke in the synagogue to Jewish people and then eventually to Gentiles as well. He, he, for those three weeks, he talked to them about Jesus Christ, who Jesus was, that Jesus was the Son of God, that Jesus had been come as the perfect Lamb of God, paid the sacrifice for sins. He had died on a cross because he loved us so much that he died there. He's risen from the dead. He's alive again. He sent his Holy Spirit to come dwell amongst us. And he spent three weeks teaching the Jews there in Thessalonica. In fact, this... The information that we find on, is found in Acts uh, 17. Now, let, let me just read that for you, uh, this description of what happened when Paul got to Thessalonica. Acts 17, verses 1 through 15. <clears throat> when Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and they joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. That's where Paul and Silas had been staying. <clears throat> but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. And when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the Jewish believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue again, as was Paul's custom. Now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Let me just pause there for a minute, by the way. Notice, he's not saying that the Berean Christians were of more noble character than the, than the Thessalonican Christians. Incidentally, how long had they been Christians in Thessalonica? At best, at best, at the most, three weeks. You think about it. Those of you who have committed your life to Jesus Christ, 
you're three weeks old. At best, for some of you, maybe just did it the last Sabbath. You've, you've committed your life to Christ. You're brand new, and guess what? You're already experiencing persecution. Isn't that wonderful? Jason's being hauled out in front of the crowds. Other Christians, they're going to be beat. It's going to get nasty for them. And what, what actually Luke is saying for us here is, is that it's the Greeks who, excuse me, the, the Jews who are listening, they're not yet even committed, but at least they're more gracious. They're not as mean-spirited as the, as the Jews in Thessalonica. Now remember that, because the Thessalonian Christians, brand new in their faith, are going to be dealing with those Thessalonian Jews who are mean going on verse 12 as a result many of them believed and as did also a number of prominent greek women and many greek men but when the jews in thessalonica oh there's those guys again learned that paul was preaching the word of god at berea some of them went there too agitating the crowds and stirring them up the believers immediately sent paul to the coast but silas and timothy stayed at berea those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. And that's where we pick up first, first Thessalonians. Paul spent three weeks with these brand new believers in Thessalonica. He's moved on to Berea. He's now left Berea. He's headed on out to, <clears throat> to Athens. He will eventually write from Corinth. And he's a concerned about those Christians that he met for just this very short time back in Thessalonica. He asked Timothy, a very special friend of his, who he would rather have with him, but he says, Timothy, I want you to stay here. I want you to take care of these people. And by the way, please bring me some news. I'm like, I'm really concerned. I don't know what's happened to them. I don't know anything about them. And, and I just know it got really bad for them. And that was after just three weeks. And so Timothy, let me know, because I'm afraid maybe, I don't know, maybe they've just already fallen away. Maybe the, the root was just too shallow. Maybe the seed just didn't go very far at all. And, and maybe the persecution is too great. And so I'm afraid, but um, would you please let me know what you, what you find out? And that's when we come to 1 Thessalonians. Thessalonica was an interesting place. The people there would paint obscene paintings on the walls of their houses. No, this was not just a nice artwork. It was sexual... Uh, it was a lascivious city. Divorce was very frequent. In fact, babies were simply abandoned. That was the modern way of doing abortion. You simply just, you didn't like your baby, you put him out on the street and let him die, or her die. Oftentimes, little girls. Murder was common in Thessalonica. It, and it was in this very sewage pipe that the church lived in Thessalonica. Maybe that's why, one of the reasons why Paul later in chapter 4 is going to talk about abstaining from sexual immorality, about remaining pure in a sexually crazed culture. Uh, doesn't sound like porn or anything like that in our culture, right? It, yeah, it doesn't, I'm sure it doesn't compare at all. <clears throat> Have any of you seen uh, or heard the commercial about the smell good plumber? <laughs> yeah. The, the smell, smell good pl plumber. There's no bubbas here, uh, just, uh, but we have smell good plumbers. And, and the smell good plumber promises that when he gets to your house, he'll get there on time and smell good. Well, I was thinking about that because, in fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16 says, For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are an aroma that brings death. To the other an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? And I got thinking, are we a smell good church? <laughs> I mean, frankly, you know, if you walk in and it smells bad, that also might make you turn around, right? But there's all kinds of other ways that we can smell. In fact, in fact the, the question I really need to ask you is, are you a smell good Christian? Notice what Paul says is that we're the aroma of Christ do you smell like Jesus? Do you give off an aroma that's going to draw somebody closer to God? Because you see, well, we could very easily make this just about Crestline First Baptist Church, and we're just going to evaluate Crestline First Baptist Church. I think there is so much more that Jesus wants to do here. That Jesus wants to speak to each one of us about our relationship with him. 
and how we are living for him. And so, while it will, be, it will be easy for you, and I, I confess I probably will help make it easy for you. It will be easy for you just to look at Crestline for ba- First Baptist and, and evaluate the good and the bad of Crestline First Baptist. But you will miss what God wants to do if you just look at this church. Because guess what? The church is made up of people. And the Lord is wanting to work in you to evaluate you and have you ask yourself. And so I ask you, are you a smell good Christian? And in fact, let me take it one step further. Do your prayers smell good? Do you see what Paul prayed? He says, look, I only known these people for three weeks. I know things going really bad for them. I know they're really in pain. They're suffering. They're being persecuted. There are nasty people there that hate them. The anger is exploding. They're rioting in the city. And I, so I know it's bad for them. And so, but he says, look, I'm praying with thanksgiving for them. Every time I remember them in my prayers, and I'm doing this regularly on a daily basis or more, I am thanking God for them. Is that the way you pray for other people? Are you a smell good prayer? Or maybe I should ask you this, are you sharing your pretzels with other people? Are, are, are you blessing them for, for what they're doing in your life? Are you telling them that and letting them know that you appreciate them? Do you give thanks like Paul did? Because look what he said. We always thank God for all of you. For all of you. Uh-oh. Well, we thank God for everyone on this side of the room, but not about this. Side. <laughs> it's not about you, George. <laughs> Paul spent three weeks. I appreciate the, the uh, International Children's Bible, the way it translates this. It says, when we pray to God our Father, we always thank Him for the things you have done because of your faith. And we thank Him for the work you have done because of your love. And we thank Him that you continue to be strong because of your hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And what the text is going to give to us is uh, there's going to be several different points that he wants us to evaluate about our relationship with God. The first one is evaluate your work produced by faith. The, The Thessalonians showed that they had faith by the way they were behaving. In fact, James 2 says it this way, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If any one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed. That's like really going to warm them up, isn't it? You just go and, and, and you enjoy the fact that the Spirit's going to feed you. No, no. If you're going to really feed somebody, you've got to give them actual food. Says, but, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. But watch out, even the demons believe. And they shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? So the question you need to ask yourself today, you begin this evaluation process, and and some of you are like, oh, nah, this is just about the church. Okay, well, ask yourself, does the church have a living, active faith? In fact, if you're ever looking for a church sometime, you might want to start there. Does the church that you're examining, that you're visiting, and you're trying to find out if this is a church for you, does it have a living, active faith? Can you see the evidence of their faith in God? Someone said it, that only man comprehends what he cannot see and believes what he cannot comprehend. Much of what we comprehend we cannot see, right? Don't most of you comprehend cells, atoms, germs? Everybody here comprehend love? I didn't say that you're an expert in it or you're doing it well. How about hate, loyalty, 
sacrifice. These are all things that we can comprehend, but we don't really see them, right? He who lives by sight lives poorly. Faith is learning to live by insight rather than sight. John Bloom said it this way, trusting Jesus is hard. It requires following the unseen into an unknown and believing Jesus' words over against the threats we see or the fears we actually feel. What God wants is for you to trust what he says over what you see. That's faith. Faith sees the, Corey Ten Boom said, faith sees the invisible, believes the unbelievable, and receives the impossible. And Spurgeon said it this way, faith and obedience are bound up in the same bundle. He that obeys God trusts God. He that trusts God does what? Obeys God. So we need to evaluate, is our work produced by faith? Secondly, evaluate your labor prompted by love. You see, the actions and the behaviors of the Thessalonians is actually being motivated by love. And think about it, it's all the ramifications of love. It's being motivated by the fact that they right now have experienced love like they've never felt it before. They've experienced the love of God. But it's not only motivated by the fact that they've experienced the love of God, but it's motivated because that love of God has inspired them to love others. Isn't that what the Bible says? The most, most important commandment is what? Love God. And what's the second one? Love your neighbor as yourself. And, and, and because of Jesus, these people are starting to have a labor, action that's prompted by love. Their love for God inspires their, them to act in love for other people. 2 Corinthians 5 says this, for Christ's love compels us. When, when you've experienced Christ's love, when you've really, when you know that God loves you, it starts to so grab a hold of you that, that what Paul uses here as the word is it compels you. It moves you into something that you just can't hold back. Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves. Christ's love compels me to stop living for me but to start living for others but for him who died for them and was raised again. It's, see, my love for God starts to change the way I love other people. Because God loves me, I start to love him more. Because I start to experience the, his love, I then start to love others more. And, and my labor is changed by my love. First John said it this way, Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And whoever does not love does not know God. You want to check with and see whether you know God or not? You want to see if you're saved or not, if you want to use that word? You want to really find out, am I really a Christian or not? Examine your love. Because if you don't understand, if, you, if you're not loving, then you may want to question, do I really know this God who is love? Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So you need to ask yourself as you're, if you're, as you're examining, does this church love God? Do you love Jesus? <laughs> yeah, we, we are getting to enjoy a little bit of grandparenting, but we're missing it now because uh, um, Jan and Phil have moved to, the, to Florida, right? But you know what? One of the things that Debbie and I have both done a lot of since um, Theo was born and even Tenley was born and that one was really, uh, like, I'm not going to diaper a girl, I mean, especially as messy as she is. <laughs> but what do you do? And, and what do you do when, when you love? I, I know very few parents who say, oh, man, I just love the messy ones. <laughs> what are you smoking? I mean... <laughs> But the fact is, is that why do we change the messy diapers? Because we love the child. 
and it's love that motivates us. And you need to ask yourself, do you love Jesus? Because your actions are going to show whether you love Jesus or not. And, and, and may I ask you this also? By the way, crew, you answer this one. Are any of you guys dating? <laughs> yeah, a few of you, huh? Did you miss her the last couple of days? Yes. Nah, you're not a crew. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, come on, just, just, just do this quick. Did you miss her the last couple of days? Thank you. Yeah, yeah you missed her. Well, what are you going to do for her to let her know that you care about her? Now, I don't know. Maybe you haven't said love yet, okay? And, and you know, I don't know. You got, you got to go through some stages, right? But have you said you like her, okay? And because you like her, because maybe even it's already moved to the level of love, what are you going to communicate with her? And, and are you doing something to try to express love to her? Well, if you love Jesus... Aren't you going to express that love to other people? That's what Paul's saying. And that's what he's celebrating, this labor of love that is coming out of the Thessalonian church. <clears throat> and then he goes on to this third one. So you evaluate your faith, you evaluate your love. And then he says, evaluate your endurance inspired by hope. It's kind of like, how committed are you? You see, the thing that's keeping these people going in Thessalonica, and remember, who, who are they with in Thessalonica? The nasty Jews <laughs> that are really mad at them. Berea is where the good Jews are, but in Thessalonica is where the, the, the mean Jews are, and, and they're making things really bad for them. And, and what does he say? It's let love, excuse me, let Christ keep you going in the middle of your pain. In fact, isn't this what keeps Paul going even as he awaits execution? When he gets to Rome and he's finally gotten there and he's preaching to Caesar and he's accomplished what God's wanted for him and he's going to soon die, what is it that keeps him going? What is it that gives him hope as he waits for literally for his head to be cut off? Wow, that sounds like fun. 2 Timothy 4, 7-8. Here's what keeps him going. I've fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Later he'll say, you know, whether I stay here or whether I go, I get to be with Jesus. And it's Jesus that motivates him. It's Jesus and Jesus' relationship with Jesus that gives him hope. In fact, 1 John says, in fact, this is love for God to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So no matter what kind of pain you're going through, no matter what kind of suffering, no what, what kind of challenge you're facing, Jesus is the victory. Jesus is the Son of God. And if you believe in Him, you're going to have victory over whatever it is. I have found this poem that says, The difficulties in our lives, the obstacles we face, give God the opportunity to show His power and grace. Ray Steadman said, Paul puts it that way so that we may see these as the great motives of the Christian life. If you have true faith, if you have love born of the Spirit, and if you have hope in the coming of Christ, you will be motivated to live as you ought to live today. Well, as Paul goes on in verses 4 and 5, he says, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power and with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. And you know how we lived among you for your sake. And this brings me to the point that I think that, that God wants us to evaluate what the gospel has done to us. What has the good news of Jesus Christ done to you? How has it influenced and affected your life? I, I don't remember who said it, but he says, so here they are, this group of brand new baby Christians in a very difficult culture, without leadership, being harassed by people who are hostile toward what was so very new to them. 
Paul was concerned, and so a couple of months have passed. He sends Timothy back, and he sends him back with a very explicit goal of getting a report on the condition of the Thessalonian church because he fears the worst. When Timothy comes back to him, Timothy says, I'm here to tell you the best. They're absolutely amazing. They are absolutely amazing. Paul, the gospel has changed their life. These people are different because of the good news of Jesus Christ. The word, they've heard the word. But, but Paul, they didn't just hear the word. The, the word has had a powerful effect on their lives. It's, it's made them different. What about you? Whoa. Hey, crew, you guys have been hearing the word for the last couple, three days, right? What's it done for you? What are you allowing it to do for you? Church, some of you have been here weeks and weeks and months and years and decades. What's the word of God done in your life? Are you just hearing the word? Does it just tickle your ears as the Bible says? Or are you doing something different because the word has changed you? Well, Paul goes on, he says, and, and, and Timothy, as he's reporting all these, he says, Paul, they've got power. They've experienced God's power in salvation. Do you remember when you said yes to Jesus Christ, if you've done that? Do you remember how it, how it touched you? Do you remember how, literally how you felt when you came to believe, Jesus loves me, this I know for, the Bible tells me so, and I believe it today. Do you remember how it, it, it gave you kind of just a, a new bounce in your step, a, a new excitement for life? Do you remember the power of salvation? That's what he says in, in Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Do you remember when Christ Jesus came into your life are you living like you've got the power? And then Paul goes on, he says, and, and, and look, and they're, and they're living with the Holy Spirit. Why did Paul go to Thessalonica? Because the Spirit of God sent him there. Why did God speak to the people he spoke to? Because, uh, in fact, Paul says, because God had chosen them. Specifically selected them to receive the love of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit had been at work speaking to them, changing their lives. <clears throat> Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. Why? Because the Holy Spirit had made those divine appointments. And then he uses this last phrase. He says, and they accepted the word with deep conviction. Paul believed that Jesus was risen from the dead, didn't he? His conviction motivated him to go through all kinds of horrors simply because he believed in Jesus Christ. It was a conviction that drove him literally to Rome, ultimately to death. It was a conviction that wouldn't let him go. What about your convictions? How deep are they? See, the Thessalonians... They share the same deep conviction that had changed Paul's life as well. Well, as I begin to wrap up this morning, I just want you to evaluate your, how you're living. And where I really want you to evaluate it is, and, and crew, retreats are great because you can get close to God, have you know, special spiritual moments, all right, right? But where do you need to really evaluate how you're living? In Pomona. On the campus. In Crestline. At the restaurants. At the post office. On the streets, in the parking lot. As you meet people along the journey, on your job. You, you need to evaluate how you're living out there. Second Corinthians says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though if God were making his appeal, what? 
through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And may I ask you this? Does what you say match what you do? In fact, the other side of that is true as well. Does what you do match what you say? Does the conduct of your life match the, the things, your, your testimony, so to speak, what comes, comes off of your lips? And, and can the people around you hear what you really believe? Are they hearing what you want them to believe? Are they hearing Jesus? How would you evaluate yourself? How would you evaluate Crestline First Baptist Church? Oh yeah, how do you smell? <laughs> Jesus. For the guys of crew, they've had a special time with you, Lord. You've been trying to really speak to them and challenge them and help them to grow closer and really equip them to, to go back to the Pomona Valley and to, to make a difference there. To be inspired by the fact that they're not alone, that you're with them and that, that they've other guys with them and that there's mentors and coaches and people who will come alongside, that, that there's resources, most of all, the Holy Spirit available. God, you, I've just been trying to say that to the crew men who are here for their retreat. I've been saying it for the guys at Serenity that even though life is difficult and there's the lots of things behind their addictions, Lord, you love them and you care about them and you're making them into somebody brand new and they can change. But you're not just saying that to Serenity either, Lord. You're saying it to the guest that's here maybe for the first time. You're saying it to the person who's been here for years. You're saying it to every believer who's seated in this sanctuary that, God, you want to make life different and you want to be the aroma of Christ in us. And you're calling us to evaluate and, and to examine and really see are we allowing Jesus to truly live in us? Is his spirit really uh, working through us? Are we showing love? Do we have faith? Are we laboring in ways that make a difference? Oh God, I pray that we won't fear the evaluation, but that the evaluation would move us to greater commitment, greater conviction, to, be, to smelling better. And today, Lord, if there's somebody here who hasn't made that commitment, and maybe they've watched and seen and said, man, they're, they may be weird, but there's something special here. And I'd invite that person to say yes to Jesus. It may be that there's somebody here that needs to, to go from here today and say, you know, it's time for me to, uh, to quit trying to do this thing on my own. But to allow others to support me and me to give of myself to others and really to become a part of a fellowship of Christ followers. God, I'd pray that you would have your way in every person's life that's seated here today. And if you need to say yes to Jesus today, you know, I, I would simply invite you to do that right now. In, in your own special way, you, you talk to Jesus. He's listening. And if you're not sure he's real, then ask him to prove himself. Ask him to do something to help you to know that he's real. And if you're ready to really serve him, I invite you to commit yourself fully to obey God and to go be the aroma of Jesus wherever you're at. The Thessalonians were serving Jesus and witnessing to people within three weeks of coming to know Jesus. How about you? This morning also, if you have a prayer need, and you need some others to have a little more faith for you than you have. I invite you to share that prayer need on the on the tarot, excuse me, on the insert that's in the worship bulletin. Put it in the offering plate in a few moments. In fact, I'm going to give you to all, everyone right now the next few moments. Talk to Jesus. Talk to Jesus right now. You right there where you're seated. You talk to him.
God, thank you for hearing our prayers. Lord, I pray for especially these guys from crew as they get ready to travel down the mountain now. Uh, Lord, bless them as they travel. Uh, continue uh, what you've been saying to them up here this weekend. Lord, I, I pray that they'll sense your presence, that, that they'll realize that your word is so alive and you've been speaking real love and truth into their hearts. And I pray that they'll go back and they'll give away what they've been receiving. Help them to keep growing. Bless them in all of their relationships. Help them to honor you above all things. Thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen.